Hello and welcome to our home. What's more important, our appearance or reality? What we are or what people think about us? Do you think that's changed during uh, this pandemic? Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, we're more isolated. We don't get those social cure, cure, cues from people that we used to get, the body language, tone of voice, and so on. We get a little bit of it on Zoom, maybe, or... Uh, some kind of video chat, but uh, it's not the same. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, that and how to live a genuine life during this uh, global pandemic and, and uh, always. My name is Pastor David Burkadal. My wife, the Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these video streams of Living Water to provide an opportunity for reflection during this uh, pandemic and a chance to get a sense that, that we are connected, that we are truly not alone. <coughs> Excuse me. Today is our 52nd video in this series. It, it hardly seems possible. It's been six months. Uh, where does the time go? It's been a weird time, a time of great adjustments, great sacrifices, great loss, and for some uh, a sense of gain and uh, new opportunities to to go inward, to grow uh, in many ways, develop new um, uh, abilities and uh, uh, things that, that we didn't know we could do that we now can, to grow closer in our relationship, to realize there's some work that needs to be done in our relationship. Many, many things have, uh, have become possible for us uh, during this time. Uh, during this time, however, we, we've had an opportunity to reflect on our culture, where we are as a nation, and uh, what, what work needs to be done uh, nationally as well as uh, within ourselves. I was thinking about this the other day when uh, I remembered a story from one of the members of the church I served uh, in San Dimas for about 31 years. Uh, she was an English teacher in China who then uh, was with her organization here locally. It was headquartered in San Dimas. Uh, became an executive for it uh, and would go over and uh, supervise English language teachers in China. Now, this was an organization that sent uh, English language teachers who were Christian. Uh, there are no missionaries in China from foreign countries. They're not allowed there, haven't been for some time. And so um, China is also desperate for people who can teach English, and they're willing to allow Christians to come and teach under certain conditions. Uh, it's probably as close as we're ever, well, that we're going to come uh, to uh, missionaries to China, at least for some time. Uh, on the, the other side of that coin, however, is that it's caused a, an indigenous church to grow, so that, that's the plus side. But uh, for others who want to come and share the gospel, it's impossible, unless you're an English teacher and you agree to the restrictions that uh, you can have a Bible on your desk, but you can't talk about it unless someone asks. You can go to church, but you can't uh, invite people to go to church with you. Very, very strict uh, um, uh, requirements. So one year, our member went over to supervise teachers, and she met with a regional official who was very upset because someone had crossed the line. And they talked for a long, long time. Finally, at the end of uh, their discussion, the uh, official said, look, we are willing to pretend we don't know what you're doing if you are willing to pretend you're not doing it. And that, I remember, said that that's China. It's an honor and shame culture. It's a culture in which people are, are um, evaluated as much, if not more, by their appearance than the reality of circumstances. We'll uh, uh, allow you to do what you say you're not doing um, and we'll pretend that you're not doing it. That, that's okay, because then everybody's satisfied. Uh, people's honor is satisfied. Now, in our culture, we, I think, uh, operate more by uh, achievement, achievement that can be measured uh, and quantified, like uh, education or where you live or the kind of car you drive or the clothes you wear or your education, all those things that, that provide status within our culture. But there are many cultures in the world um, not just China, all over the world. In fact, there are traditional uh, cultures in the Middle East that oper uh, operate on the same principle of honor and shame. Uh, in some traditional uh, parts of the Middle East, if a girl, for example, gets pregnant and she's not married, 
it's her brother's duty to kill her for dishonoring the family. Or think about the culture of the New Testament, honor and shame culture. Uh, Joseph was a uh, good man, uh, one of the great men of the Bible. There, we don't know a lot about him, and he seems to disappear from Jesus' life after the age of 12. We think, uh, you know, life expectancy wasn't that great. He might have died of natural causes. Or there was a lot of violence between the citizens of Israel and the uh, occupying uh, empire of Rome. He may have died in an uprising. But at the beginning of the story, at the very beginning of the Bible, in the uh, first chapter, I'm sorry, of the New Testament, first chapter of the New Testament, uh, we get this story uh, from Joseph, who, who the story gives us some insight into this honor and shame culture of the New Testament, it's beginning at the 18th verse. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, now let me just say something about that. This was a betrothal, not, not like our sense of engagement. It was a legal relationship that could only be broken by a legal divorce. It was a big deal. During this time, uh, the couple got ready for the wedding. They lived with their parents for up to a year, and they remained virgins throughout that entire time. That was the, the, the time in which this happened. Mary... Um, uh, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Mary was pregnant, and Joseph knew it wasn't his. He could legally have had her stoned to death for this dishonor he had brought upon him and his family, as well as her, her family. But he decided instead, being a righteous man, to put her away quietly, to they, they just divorce her. And then an angel showed up and everything changed. You know the rest of the story. That's honor and shame. Or when Jesus performed his first miracle, changing water into wine. Uh, this is at the very, almost at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, uh, commonly read at uh, wedding services. Uh, here, uh, John uh, describes this miracle uh, in this way. And I just want to say about miracles that uh, sometimes they're described as a suspension of the natural order. But it's been said that they are, in fact, a restoration of the natural order, the way things ought to be. Here in, in this uh, second chapter, uh, it goes like this. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. <laughs> now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward uh, called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So that's honor and shame. The, Jesus didn't do this miracle because he, he wanted the guests to, to have a great party. Uh, he did this to avoid the social embarrassment, the loss of standing within his, among his peers and in his community of the father of the bride, the host of, of the wedding. This would have been a disaster to run out of the stuff of wedding, uh, weddings during the reception. And these receptions were not you know, a couple hours after the wedding. This, these receptions could go on for a week. Uh, you were, needed a lot of wine, and, and you had to prepare for it. Uh, 
families prepared their entire lives for, for these things. And to have run out of wine was a great social faux pas. Uh, it's been said that this is a miracle for God's ex extravagant grace. Here, Jesus gives what is unnecessary, uh, but what is necessary for a celebration. We need water. We don't need wine. But Jesus produced the wine in order to demonstrate God's extravagant grace is, is going beyond God's unearned love for God's people. Uh, for we all run out of what is necessary in order to put ourselves right in the eyes of God. But that, uh, and apart from God, there can be no satisfaction in life, but God produces what we cannot produce ourselves. Now, it's interesting to read these stories uh, because uh, they're so foreign to our own culture. Uh, do most people think more about retaining their honor or how to lower standards? Do we think about shame at all? Or do we above all else want not to think, have people think of us as being judgmental? What do you think? Do, you, do we only value a success in our culture at the way our culture defines it? Do we even think about honor in our culture? And do we have a capacity for shame? Share your comments in the comments section below. When I was in ninth grade, uh, I was on vacation with my family and my brothers and sister. Uh, we're going to have a family uh, sibling Zoom call this afternoon. And I, I would be willing to bet if I mentioned the story, I'd only have to say one word and say, oh yeah. They sometimes bring that up to me uh, to remind me uh, of what I was like as a ninth grader. And I have to say, I had a bit of a, maybe more than a bit, I had a temper. Uh, we were uh, on vacation in, uh, I think it was somewhere around Chicago. And uh, Sunday, and we were getting ready to go to church. And, and uh, my parents said, David, you need to change into something uh, nice for church. I was wearing shorts and some kind of shirt and something. You can't wear shorts to church. And I said, well, I'm, this is what I'm wearing. We're on vacation. I'm wearing shorts to church. My parents said, no, you're not wearing shorts to church. That, 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 no, that, that's just not going to happen. And I, and I got you know, angry. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. I, I was arguing theologically. I said, God sees our heart. God doesn't care what we wear to church. And my parents were getting a little heated, too. I said, well, we care what you wear, and you're not wearing uh, shorts to church. And, and I have to say, it may be that in that hotel room, a chair may have been thrown. I was so uh, angry. My, my, my younger siblings remember that. Um, uh, but in the end, I was right. And they were right. Uh, how do we show our awe and respect for the living God? God does only see our heart, not what's on the external uh, of us. He doesn't care. Those things are uh, immaterial to God. But, but they're important to us uh, because we live not in order to please God. Because of the cross, we lived to, in response to God's love for us, God's unearned love for us because of the cross. That's the gift of God's grace. Uh, what do we show people when we share the Christian life? How do we embody that in a way that, that is meaningful? Uh, I think most people would say, come and visit my church, or come and hear our choir, or come and hear our pastor, or, or come and hear our worship band. You know, they're all great. But where do people actually get to a living relationship with the living God? How do people come to that, that faith, that, that living relationship that is God's gift to us, to all who believe? And so, because of that gift, uh, enter into a life of faith that, that is a, a truly transformed life, a new life, not as a consumer of services from the church, but as a giver, a sharer of what God has done for me. How, how do we come to that point in our churches? Uh, do, where do people find relationships um, with mentors? Where do they uh, find people in need for whom they can be a mentor? God is ultimate reality. How much reality are we willing to, to know and to share? We can't give away what we don't have. How do we develop that sense of a, of a genuine life, a life that truly is lived as God has created human beings to live the abundant life that God has created for us. We're at a point in the pandemic now where over a million people have uh, uh, been uh, confirmed to have uh, the virus uh, throughout uh, the uh, world. Who knows how honest our countries are being in, in uh, reporting the, their deaths 
uh, it would be anathema for people in honor and shame cultures to, to, to be shamed for any official to say, yep, this has happened under my watch to report the truth. So how do we, how do we uh, tweak the numbers to get to a real number? Uh, in our country, I, I believe we've been pretty accurate in producing those numbers. So far, uh, we've had um, uh, over 700,000 confirmed cases in our country and almost 13,000 have died. Just in, I'm sorry, in our state, in California. Yet leaders all over the world, including in our country and in, the, in, our, in our state, have, uh, have to beg people in order to do the simple things, like wearing masks, washing your hands, all those things that, that, uh, that are necessary and, and are very easily done, but can literally save lives. Have we no honor in these things? Have we no shame over our behavior? Are we unwilling to do what is required to care for a brother or a sister? The Dodgers are in the playoffs now. They beat the uh, Brewers last night. Um, one more game and that's that and we move on. But I was thinking uh, uh, with regard to the Dodgers about Leo DeRocher, who coached the Brooklyn Dodgers. Before the Dodgers came to L.A., they were in Brooklyn. Leo DeRocher was uh, famous for many things, and one of them was a quote, nice guys finish last. Gary Shandling, the, uh, the comedian, um, reflecting on, on the state of, of life, uh, said that, that nice guys finish first. And anyone who doesn't know that doesn't know where the finish line is. Now, that's a truly embodiment of what the Christian life is. We live by a larger scale. Our creeds include the words, our core belief statements, that Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead, that there will be re a resurrection of the body and life everlasting. That's the scale. That's the finish line. That's the, the measure by which we measure a genuine life. It's lived in response to God's grace. It's unearned love for us and for our welfare. Paul, Paul wrote a letter to the church at Rome and said, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the center around which our lives revolve. Turn away from sin. Turn away from that which is separating you from God. Christ died for you so that you can receive the gift of God's love in Jesus Christ. Christ the gift of faith, a living relationship with a one true living God that saves us, not because we've earned it, but because we've accepted the gift of God in a living faith. God calls us to mentorship. God calls us to live by the center as we have received the gift. Seek the mentorship of a Christian you respect. Be a mentor to someone who needs something genuine in their life, the genuine love of God. This is the only way to live a genuine life, by giving it away. We all, in a sense, live lives of honor and shame. Our shame and Christ's honor. Let us live lives that are genuine to the glory of God. Let us pray. We pray to be members of the body of Christ at our local church that embody your love and share that love with those around us. We pray to be faithful in contributing and making a difference in the lives of those within and outside of the church. We pray for all those whose lives are filled with a struggle with the coronavirus and those who are caring for them. We pray for all those affected by the fires in California and throughout the world, the, the change of climate that, that is devastating uh, places everywhere. And all those who are as a result of these and other challenges now financially struggling. We pray for those who provide essential services and for those who seek the common good, for those struggling for racial equality and those who protect and serve. We pray for those who seek to derail the efforts of people of goodwill, that their hearts may turn from destruction and toward the building up of all people. We pray for those struggling with all forms of violence, with mental health issues and with substance abuse. We pray for the most vulnerable among us and for those who feel insecurities of any kind. And for all the leaders of our government and of our church. And toward this end, may we be your instruments for good. 
we bring before you the requests that have been made known to us. For Kelly, for healing after stomach cancer surgery. For Dean George Pindua and our brothers and sisters in Tanzania. For one's mother, for healing of cancer and for her and her extended family, for peace in your presence and promise. For Sally's sister Susan, for Jeff and Bill, for healing. And for one's family members who have COVID-19 and are caring for each other. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, we bring before you in the words of the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So stay hydrated, drink water. It's going to be hot again today. Uh, stay hydrated with the streams of living water that is God's presence in the Holy Spirit to nourish and sustain us in God's love and presence. To remember your church. Uh, if you don't have a church, find one to pray for your pastor and your church leaders. Uh, if you're having thoughts of suicide or struggling with mental health issues, reach out to someone. There are people around you who do care for you. You are not alone. Remember to wear your masks, practice uh, social distancing, wash your hands or sanitize them, avoid crowds. If you have to go out in crowds, uh, be sure to, uh, that they stay small and that you keep your distance and to be kind to everyone. I was reflecting on what David said about um, just m missing expressions on people's faces except through a Zoom medium. And I realize I'm beginning to sort of think that I can recognize different animals in our garden. You know, <laughs> I almost want to call them by name, but, you know, I'm sure it's just being around them too, too much. Um, but what is really touching me today is in the last 24 hours, we heard that Christy Teigen and John Legend had lost a baby. And um, people from all over the world have have shared their stories with them have shared their grief and it was real the way they presented it uh, david and i lost a baby when our son james was three we just were in our first the end of the first trimester but uh, very pre um, social media so we didn't have millions of people saying thank you for sharing that and we're praying for you uh, i went through that too um, i too lost a precious one uh, and the well, the gift they gave in sharing that with the world, literally, was to me very healing. And I have, think it has been for others. And what touched me was so many cards and calls that we got. Um, it was so moving, but so healing for me to know that there were people that understood this wasn't just something that happened. This was a life that didn't happen. Uh, and it was uh, very hard for us. Um, I'm remembering back to uh, seminary days when I was an intern at a church that was my home church out here, and I was leading a Bible study. Wednesday mornings were Bible study in the chapel, and um, I w was thinking that there was one member of the, the group that had seemed sad, quite sad and very depressed, and you know, at any rate, she, she, la she said she, she could talk to me, and I talked to her, and we talked about her depression. She had a wonderful family, great kids, she was probably in about her late 40s. And everything she couldn't understand, her, her therapist couldn't understand, what was it that was causing her to be so depressed? And I said, was there anything in your life? Can you think of anything in your life that, that, that you know, you've lost or that went wrong? And is there something that just is hidden that you just can't, you know, bring out, that can't help you? And she said, well, you know, we did, you know, when we first married in the first year of our marriage, we did have a miscarriage. Well, actually, it was a stillbirth, and I just looked at her. She said, yeah, we lost a baby. Uh, it was, she was stillborn. She came early. And uh, my mother-in-law just said, oh, you know, I wouldn't want to see her or anything. The nurses didn't bring her in. And then, of course, there was no mention there should be a memorial service or anything. And as she was talking, and I was like, <laughs> well, thinking, okay, I think this could be it, I said to her. And she said, and she started crying. So I, I said to her, do you think it would be healing for you and the family and your husband or anyone or friends to have a service here in the chapel uh, for your little girl and to name her and to um, have a feeling that she existed 
she was here um, though briefly she lived very briefly just maybe a few minutes after birth and she said yes and we did we did this um, service for her and I it what touched me so was that she felt so alone in her grief um, and was never able to express it and I know there are those those of us during this time especially who are grieving over loss and uh, perhaps even the loss of a child and I I want us to know that you know as, as David mentioned we can reach out and we can share our grief with others and we will find out that we've helped to heal them as well when we've shared it and we want to remember what Christ said and what he always says to us lo I am with you always even to the end of the age amen